We made it through chapters one, two, and three in the Biomechanics and Movement book. We're now going on to part two, production of movement. And in part two, we begin with muscle biology and force. So that's where we're going to start. And I'm going to begin by just talking about basic muscle structure and force generation. And what I want you to be able to think about is how muscles transform the chemical energy of food into mechanical work. And that transformation begins at a very small scale, at a nanometer scale, at cross bridges between myosin and actin, where a single molecule of ATP is converted into mechanical work on the order of a piconewton, 10 to the minus 12th newtons. With all those forces adding up into the very large forces we see at the whole muscle level. So we're gonna do biology across these scales. We're gonna make computations across all these scales. And I want you to be able to think across scales. It's one of the most powerful things you can have as a biomechanical engineer. So that's the plan. The big picture is this. We're going to start with the transformation from neural command to force. One of the most tricky things we do in biomechanics is try to estimate what the neural command is. What is your brain, what signals are your, is your brain sending down your spinal cord and out to muscles to generate force? In the next lectures, we'll focus on this transformation from neural command to muscle force. We'll do some biology, we'll do some mechanics, and we'll do some math. The next is because muscles don't act in isolation, they operate in your skeletal system. We're going to talk about musculoskeletal geometry. So transfer neural command to muscle force. Those muscle forces then are transformed into joint moments through musculoskeletal geometry. So over the next set of lectures, in this production of movement section, we'll be talking about how to get from your brain out to muscle and down to your bones. So how to transform your neural signals into human movement. So the plan for today will follow this path. We'll talk about what's cool about muscle, a little bit about muscle structure and biology. We'll pause there and then go into detail on muscle properties, in particular two very important properties, the force length relationship and the force velocity relationship. We'll pause there and then we'll talk about tendon. Tendon is in series with muscle. Tendon enables force to get from muscle out to the bone. So we'll talk about tendon and we'll conclude this first section to talk about a hill type model of muscle. It's named after A.V. Hill, very famous muscle scientist who won the Nobel Prize for his work in muscle metabolics, and will formulate a mathematical and engineering model of muscle. So that's our plan going forward. So let's start to talk a little bit about what's cool about muscle. We couldn't do anything without muscle. It links your brain to the world. We can think things, but we can't do anything without muscle. It's how we speak, it's how we move our tongue, it's how we move our hands, grasp, walk, move, so it's really critical to all aspects of life. We'll see that the structure is fantastic. These millions of cross bridges working together, the fascicle and hierarchical structure where we bundle the metabolic machinery of converting food into mechanical work, and the structure and architecture of whole muscle is really a beautiful thing to behold. We'll see that today. The another cool thing is that the math represents biology really well. Biology is incredibly complex. So to be able to write down a mathematical model and have that represent the biology quite well is really fantastic. And of course, muscle is the only motor that you can eat. It indeed tastes great, medium rare. Muscles actuate movement by development of tension. That's a fancy way to say Muscles pull, they don't push. 
So let's look at our two little gremlins here. Over here we have the tibialis anterior. The foot has just contacted the ground and the gremlin here is working incredibly hard. He's pulling the foot up, but the foot's lowering. So it's doing work on this muscle and it's pulling. It has an antagonist on the other side of the joint. So he now is relaxed, we're in foot flat. And now the soleus here on the other side is pulling really hard. So these two bean men are operating as antagonists. Each one pulls and then relaxes. The other one pulls while the other one's relaxing. So muscles are grouped into these antagonist pairs. And in fact, it's not just pairs of muscles like I'm showing here. It's really coordination of many muscles that are needed to coordinate movement. Even the simplest movements like a point, a pointing is result of coordination of many muscles. I mentioned at the outset that muscles have this hierarchical structure, that these molecular structures are grouped into structures called sarcomeres. Those sarcomeres are bundled into myofibrils. Those myofibrils are bundled into muscle fibers, and those fibers are packed into fascicles and whole muscles. So muscle has this hierarchical structure, and what I want to do is take a look at each stage in this hierarchy. We'll start in the middle with a fascicle. So a muscle fascicle is a group of muscle cells. So I'm drawing the cartoon here, but if you look under a microscope, you can actually see these muscle fascicles. And if you're dissecting a muscle, you can dissect out the fascicles. So if you take little tweezers in a muscle, you can peel that out and you'll get a fascicle. If you put that under a light microscope, you can see the striped pattern that gives striated muscle its name. Now a muscle cell can be anywhere from 10 to 100 microns in diameter and one to 30 centimeters long. So they're very specialized cells. Muscle fibers are muscle cells and those fibers are groups of myofibrils. Literally, myofibrils are muscle threads and under an electron microscope, you can clearly see these individual myofibrils. The source of the striped pattern are the Z discs that you can see right here. So there are the Z lines here, another Z line here, and under a microscope, those show up and those give muscle its striped pattern. So the fibers are groups of myofibrils. If we zoom in a little bit more, the basic structure is the sarcomere. So again, this is the, the dark areas are these uh, Z lines. We also have an A band and an I band. A stands for anisotropic. I is an isotropic band. That's just uh, left over from uh, when they were first discovered and what they looked at like under a microscope. Uh, if we look at a cartoon representation of this, which we'll use going forward, you can see the, the Z lines here, the Z lines here. The red show these thick filaments of myosin. Those are connected to the Z bands by Titan and they interact with actin. So that's what we're gonna zoom in on and take a closer look going forward. So the basic mechanism of force development happens at this actin-myosin cross bridge. So the thick filament is made up of myosin. And what you can see is the myosin head and the myosin tail. That myosin head is interacting with an actin filament. So shown in green here are the helical actin filaments. And in this filament, you can see the myosin head is interacting with the actin filament that I'm showing here. Now these actin filaments are quite small. Their diameter is on the order of 10 nanometers. So when muscles activated, the myosin heads attach to the thin filaments and form cross bridges. So this is kind of a a slow motion replay of what's happening in your muscle every time you excite it. So the myosin filament reaches out, attaches to the actin filament, grabs onto the actin filament and pulls it together. And it's 
trillions of these acting together that produce the very large forces that you get in skeleton muscle. Muscle shortens as these filaments slide past one another. The basic theory of muscle contraction is called this sliding filament theory, and we'll see more about that in just a minute. Zooming in on a single myosin head, there is so much going on. Every time you think of a movement, your nervous system activates your muscles. There's a whole cascade of events that happen for your muscle to be able to generate a force. And there's a little movie that shows the series of events that's happening. The basic players are the myosin head that I showed you before, the actin filament that's moving by, some regulatory proteins, troponin and tropomyosin, and then the molecules that are essential for regulating that. Calcium, for example, flying in, the muscle uh, proteins undergo a, a structural change that expose the binding site on actin. Myosin can bind, undergo a conformational change, and that's where the ATP is burned and basic chemical energy is turned into mechanical work. It's an amazing process that is happening on a very short time scale that leads to our ability to generate force. A series of reactions governs actin-myosin interaction. If you look all the way over here, we'll go through these sequences. So in this first step, we call the Rieger state, myosin is bound to actin. So you might have heard of rigor mortis. That's what happens after death. Your body goes stiff. That is a Rieger state. There's no energy there and your body goes stiff. That's exactly this myosin bound to actin that produces that. Step one, when we're living, we have ATP floating around. In step two, the ATP is bound and myosin lets go of the actin. That allows this movement of the thin and thick filaments relative to one another. Step three, ATP hydrolysis. So the myosin head ratchets forward, it moves forward. Step four, the power stroke, my favorite. The release of the phosphate of the ATP, and while the myosin moved forward, now it's ratcheting back, and that's where we get the shortening of the, the sarcomere and the muscle fiber. And finally, to complete the cycle, the release of ATP, that returns the myosin to the Rieger state, and we repeat. So that's the series of reactions that governs actin-myosin interaction. There are time constants associated with each of these. They don't happen instantaneously. And that partly dictates how fast muscle can contract. So just a little thought experiment and a calculation that I'd like you to make. How many cross bridges are needed to perform a very simple task? Just holding up a cell phone. The basic data you need, you get about one piconewton of force per actin myosin cross bridge, and about one piconewton nanometer of work per ATP molecule. So all you need to do is estimate the mass of a cell phone, say a tenth of a kilogram, and figure out what it would take to hold up a cell phone in terms of the number of active myosin interactions. Go ahead, make that calculation, and we'll see you next time. What we've talked about is what's cool about muscle, muscle structure and biology. What we're gonna move on to next is the basic properties of muscle, the force length and force velocity relationships.